Hey there friends, Dave Politis, can I Missing Project Copyrighted Edition for our video channel. Thanks for being here. This is Bigfoot 101 class number 7. And thanks for sticking around. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground. We're going to cover a lot more still. Be patient. This is my path towards educating myself on the topic. And I'm walking you down the road that I took towards an understanding of what this is all about. Now, it may not be your path, and you may not understand it, but that's okay. One thing when you walk the path, you have to have an open mind. As an investigator, when you get into a case, whatever that may be, you can't have a predetermined outcome that you want. You need to straddle that line between both or many options. And then you go where the evidence takes you. If you have a predetermined outcome that you want, you're not going to be a good investigator. So before I get too much into this class, a couple things I want to talk to you about. Many people know my son took his life almost two years ago now. And something I've never showed the audience, and I want to show you this, is this is the 2015 graduating class from Miami, Ohio's uh, hockey team. They were ranked number one in the nation. And uh, this is my son over here, Ben. And he was uh, a defenseman for them for all four years and on a scholarship. These are all the guys that graduated that year, and there are some really, really stellar individuals here. Ben was uh, 6'2", 210, and uh, he had gone to Shark Summer Camp every summer when he played at Miami, and that was an option that a lot of D1 hockey players were asked to come to NHL camps during the summer, and it was allowed because they weren't paid, and it was uncompensated just to see what it was like. Ben really enjoyed it. And Ben and I spent a lot of time talking about Bigfoot. He was really interested in the topic. And at the beginning, he thought it was all garbage. And I didn't try to convince him. But as he got older, he started to read things on his own. And he came to his own conclusions about things. And he told me one day, he said, Dad, I know it's real. I said, yeah. And that opened up an, an entirely different arena for us to talk all the time about it. All the time. And one of the last things he said to me a couple months before he took his life is, he said, Dad, we're going to make a Bigfoot movie together. Ben made it my first movie, Missing 411. He's the guy who put it all together. And uh, he was a co-director on it. And you can watch it on YouTube. It's just called Missing 411. It's free. I encourage you to watch it. Our second movie, Missing 411, The Hunted, is for free on YouTube. And one of the things that Ben knew is I spent a lot of time around Native Americans. And he had met my best friend today, Harvey Pratt. And he loved Harvey. And Harvey was a Cheyenne, or is a Cheyenne Arapaho Native American chief. And Harvey and I went to many Native American reservations together. One thing that irritated me about this Bigfoot world, and it irritated me immensely, was the attitude that many Bigfooters have toward Native Americans. Now, in this show, Finding Bigfoot, <clears throat> one person in particular on that show was very demeaning. He never validated or attempt to validate any of the information that a Native American would give them when they were on the show. They somewhat made fun of them sometimes. Not all the people on the show, just this one person. It really bothered me a lot because I've met hundreds of Native Americans that I thought were ultra credible. Harvey being one. Now, just recently, just within the last week, something's been put together for uh, an event in January 
of this coming year, just on the outskirts of Denver. It's been put together by a friend of mine named Jim Myers at the Sasquatch Outpost. And I will tell you, friends, that this is going to be an epic day in Golden, Colorado. Because he's got three people together that I don't think we'll ever probably be together again. It's just an, it's just an odd thing that we were able to put this together. And it's called Sasquatch, the Native Truth. Here's the flyer for it. Now, if you go to the Sasquatch Outpost, you'll be able to get tickets. And there's a Friday night meet and greet, and then there's a Saturday conference. Let me read, what, read to you what Jim said about this conference. He said, virtually every Native American tribe believes in Sasquatch. But what do they believe? What can we learn from their experience that dates back hundreds, if not thousands of years? Join us for an all-day conference with three nationally known speakers and experts on Native American thoughts and traditions related to Sasquatch. David Politis, Harvey Pratt, and Jonathan Dover. Jonathan was uh, part of the Navajo Nation, part of the Navajo Rangers that investigated these type of things. Harvey, uh, 40 years for the Oklahoma Bureau of Investigation, reached the rank of assistant director, was their temporary director for a while. And he walked that line between law enforcement and the spiritual world of Bigfoot. Harvey and I have done a lot of conferences together. I can tell you that he's a, uh, a riveting speaker. And uh, to get three of us together, boy, it's an honor to be even mentioned in the same limelight as those two. Jonathan, Harvey, and myself, I'm looking forward to going there and listening to those two talk. So you got to be there. And uh, it's going to be uh, January 14th. Conference runs from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the American Mountaineering Center in Golden, Colorado. Golden is uh, where Coors Beer is. And uh, if you're going to come into town for the event, you got to take the tour of the Coors facility. It's a great tour. It's a lot of fun. It's in Golden. And Golden is one of those really cool old western type towns and uh i lived just a couple miles away when i was in colorado really really neat place so uh, get a hold of uh the event through the sasquatch outpost in bailey colorado there's a link there that you can get tickets and uh, jim already told me that a bunch have already been sold so it just went up for sale the other day so i'm looking forward to that <coughs> Now, Native Americans and the world of Sasquatch, Bigfoot, Yeti, Yaren, Almosti, to not listen to what they have to say and give credibility to it is insanity. And Harvey and I, when we toured around together and interviewed hundreds of various tribal people, elders, policemen, all of the stories were so close in their facts, it, it would be impossible for everyone to rehearse it like they did. Now, before we get into the class specifics, there was an article that came out November 15, 2022, in the Seattle. S-C-I-O-T-O -O Valley Guardian, November 15th, 2022. It says, Ohio Sheriff, quote, non-human, end of quotes, creature slaughters horse found dead in creek. Ross County, Ohio. A sheriff in southern Ohio is reporting that a non-human creature slaughtered a horse overnight. It happened at a farm on Airport Road in Ross County, Ohio. The farmer stated today he found his barn torn apart and was missing a horse. He stated there was blood in the barn and on the back door was busted open. He found the horse in the creek in the back of the property dead, a deputy wrote in a report. He has cameras and stated he had checked it already and no one has been there since he was yesterday. Upon further inspection, we were able to determine that a human did not do this to the horse. The horse, after being attacked, somehow ended up in a nearby creek 
where it died. Where did this happen? So here's our map. Chillicote, Ohio. It's Highway 35. This is the Scioto River. This is Airport Road. Very close to the river. Very close to very lush, very thick woods. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, first of all, it's fascinating to me. I've never heard of something like that before. But what could move a horse? Why would a horse be found in a river or a creek? What could have torn the barn apart and done all of this without being seen on camera? See my point. How could the sheriff say that it was a non-human entity that did this? All good questions, of course. Now, a lot of people in the Bigfoot world will immediately say, oh, it was a Bigfoot, oh, it was this, oh, it was that, with no evidence. There's no evidence whatever happened to this. I find it fascinating that if a deputy says it was non-human, why didn't the deputy say what it was? That's what I'd like to know. But when you start walking this path, you can't jump to conclusions. Because once you start jumping to conclusions, eventually you're going to get found to be wrong. And then you start losing your credibility. Now, people have commented on my missing 411 work and missing 411, the UFO connection coming out December 13th. Some people like to ridicule me because I wouldn't spoon feed them every thought I had before I went to bed. And they said, oh, you know what it is. You know what's doing this. No. And if I did, I would tell you. And if there was evidence to point to what is doing this, I would tell you. Because evidence is important. And you could follow the evidence. But once I start guessing, then the trolls out there in this world would just love to jump on me once it's proven it's not true. So their other choice now is to jump on a researcher who won't tell you what's doing it and allow you to come to your own thoughts. Now, in the missing 411 work involving missing people, I've had tens of thousands, maybe more, <laughs> people read all my books, all of them, 11 books on missing people. And I can tell you that everyone who has read all 11 books has come back and said, Dave, I have no idea what's doing this. There's no, there's nothing that points to one thing that we can say for sure is the suspect. But we have all these people out there in the world that say, oh, we don't like his research. We don't like this. We don't like that. Well, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> whatever. The point being is that in the missing work, we expose things that's never been exposed before. And somebody from the federal government, the NSA, has stated that our work is related to what's happening at Skinwalker Ranch. Can't say that about anybody else's work, and they never have. But that's pretty compelling. Now, in Bigfoot world, you have researchers that have made TV shows that have gone out and tried to kill a Bigfoot. And I was called by the producers of that show and asked if I wanted to be a participant. And I said, participant for what? And they said, uh, we're going to have some people on the other side uh, saying how it's ridiculous to try to hunt and kill them and how it's a stupid effort. And I said, no, nah, I don't want any part of that. Now, do I think it's a stupid effort? I think it's an insane effort. I think it's insane because all of the evidence that I have worked up shows this is a human-based biped. Some type of hybrid. 
and I'll get and I'm walking you down this road. So one thing that I did, as you know, is I collected news articles and I used those to give me a guidepost about where I might go, where I might lean, who I might talk to. There was an article in the San Francisco Examiner on October 10th, 63. And it says, tracks a plenty, not yet a yeti. Here's what it said. Ever since Bigfoot, California's version of the abominable snowman first came into public attention, which was back in 58, there's been a mild boom in the plaster cast business. Bigfoot skulls out of the mountains and leaves sets of those enormous tracks. Then there is a rush to make plaster casts. The biggest ones are some 16 inches long. Actually not, there's way bigger ones now. But the tracks and the castings vary in size. Some of them are smaller, suggesting a lady Bigfoot or even a little Bigfoot. At least a family, if not a whole species. Human looking. The footprints are quite human looking. No claws or like that, just big flat feet. Now, big flat feet. If you carefully watch a stabilized version of the Patterson-Gimlin film, you're going to notice that when the biped picks up its foot to walk, they can actually zoom. And you, if you do some research, you can find the pictures that show the bottom of that foot and how flat it truly is. In our society, it has always been less mortifying to be thought of as a crook or a clod than be thought of as a schnook. What bugs the Bigfoot aficionados is the same thing that bugs the abominable snowman fans. Ain't nobody produced a specimen of either creature despite years of effort. Just tracks, photographs of tracker, of tracks, plaster castings of tracks. Now this is in 63. 67 was the Patterson-Gimlin film. There are some odd aspects to the tracks besides their astonishing size. They always start and end nowhere. Kaching. The Jonathan Dover interview I did at our premiere that's online that you can watch here, Jonathan talked about he and his partner being out on the Navajo property and them being professional trackers tracking a set of Bigfoot prints. And then all of a sudden they stopped in the middle of nowhere. So they went backwards and tracked them back and they started in the middle of nowhere, just like the paper said. I recently did a Bigfoot conference in Washington where one of the experts, never done an ounce of research in his life, at least not printable, got up in front of the audience and said, I've been doing this for 30 years and I've never heard a credible story about anything paranormal related to Bigfoot. Okay. Keep that in mind when you're picking out the expert you want to follow. They are found in the damnedest places, some almost inaccessible. Now there's part of this that I want you to understand. Angie and I have been in some of those very inaccessible areas. And most of the time we're not looking for Bigfoot tracks. We're out there either just hiking around or trying to find a location where this one person disappeared and trying to understand the circumstances. But if you never get out into those places, if you're never willing to pay the price, then it'll never have that epiphany in your world that, holy cow, nobody could have faked this based on where we're at because nobody would have expected anyone to be here. Bingo. Found alone. They are found alone with no suspicious looking human tracks around to suggest jiggery pokery in the high mountains. Nevertheless, the air of hoax hangs heavy in the legend of Bigfoot. It'd be tough to convince a jury of the evidence on hand. I have a vision of 12 sets of sardonic, sardonically raised eyebrows. The biggest fans study their plaster casts and photographs and brood on methods of either capturing Bigfoot or at least taking the picture. Like one rustic who has a little monologue all worked up for delivery, delivery of strangers, Bigfoot, he says, why sure? I've seen him myself this morning on my way to work. He was walking in a creek bed, 
carrying a deer under one arm and a fir tree under the other he was. Big as life, heading for home and cook his breakfast. At this point, some of the gales of wheezy laughter. I'd hate to have a, live in the same town as this con if I were a Bigfoot fancier. Study literature. It would drive me to all kinds of desperate expe expedients. I would go home and study the Bigfoot literature for clues. I would get out of my Bigfoot plaster cast and ponder the length and width of the depth. I would study my photographs and calculate the distance between the footprints and the length of the stride. I would brood on ways to prove that Bigfoot is real. And all the while, the wheezy laugh would echo, echo, echo. It has been true that there have been people who have hoaxed Bigfoot encounters. I have pictures of people that have hoaxed being a Bigfoot in costumes that, honestly, I could get a 10th grader to look at that and say, oh, that's a, that's a nickel and dime costume. So yeah, it happens. It doesn't happen as much as you think. Why? Because I think there are some crazy people out there that would take a shot at them. And uh, that's why there aren't many people running around the woods in Bigfoot costumes. So I started reading these articles like I just read here to you. Trinity County in Northern California, very rural. I've gotten into some areas back there where I doubt anyone ever stepped foot within 100 yards. Um, I've got into some areas where I got the absolute heebie-jeebies and the hair on the back of my head went up and I just said, I got to get out of here. But this is uh, about that area. This is in the record searchlight, June 10th, 66. Bigfoot for fun or real, Trinity residents wonder. Weaverville. Is Bigfoot an, an abominable snowman or just an abominable snow job? The question is being kicked around more and more in Trinity County where the prints of big bare feet turn up with dis, disconcerting irregularity. The tracks first showed up in 1947 when the Pacific Gas and Electric was building a power plant across the southern part of Trinity County. Paul Drosher, owner of the Reading Construction Company sales business, saw the tracks. He was bulldozing an access road for PG&E subcontractors in 1947. In the mornings, I would find these huge prints in the dust around my park bulldozer, Drosher said. The thing, whatever it was, was curious. It apparently walked around the bulldozer in the dark, sizing it up. Drosher at one time had a photograph of the print left in the dust by the creature. It measured 16 inches from the heel to the tip of the toe. Bigfoot has tremendous strength. Drosher tells of the time Bigfoot came upon a 100-pound barrel of tractor grease beside a road. Tracks indicated the monster had hoisted the heavy barrel in its arms and tossed it 50 feet as easily as a man might throw a small watermelon. The barrel hit the ground so hard it splattered grease all over the hillside. Bigfoot cropped up in Humboldt County in 1958. Deputy sheriffs were instructed to check out stories about the elusive monster after tracks appeared in a logging road 20 miles north of Weichpeck, a small community at the confluence of the Trinity and Klamath Rivers. The tracks were 16 inches from heel to toe and 5 inches across the ball of the foot. The stride was 50 inches when walking and 10 feet when running. The depth of the prints indicated a weight of 400 pounds. And so before I go on, 1947, most people have no idea the tracks were found that far back in California. They have no idea. It's because they didn't do their research. They think all of this started around the time Patterson Gamelin, there was no history behind it. Not true. By 1960, Tom Slick, a Texas oil millionaire, had organized an expedition to capture Bigfoot or one of its relatives. <laughs> capture Bigfoot or one of its relatives. How many, how many Bigfoot are out there? Does anybody have any idea? I've heard guesses from 1,000 to 100,000, just in North America. So I could finance an earlier expedition to look for the abominable snowman in the Himalayas. It was unsuccessful. One of the leaders of the Slick expedition was Robert Titmus, an Anderson taxidermist who finally gave up his business of stuffing animals to hunt full-time for the monster. 
Titmus hoped that the capture of the mysterious monster in a special trap so he wouldn't be harmed. Later, the expedition was armed with tranquilizer guns. There were rumors of men being helicoptered in and out of the snowbound vastness of Trinity and the Siskiyou Alps in the dead of winter as a search was pushed on, but Slick died and little has been heard about organized searches for Bigfoot since that time. Bigfoot went into seclusion until April of 1962. Tom Slick, very smart businessman, millionaire, died in an airplane crash. When I hear these stories of the, these people that were really trying to make a difference, it bothers the heck out of me. Then a set of footprints appeared near Hyampon in Trinity County, giving rise to the suspicion that Bigfoot had found himself a girlfriend for side by side with a 16 inch prints or a dainty pair of 14 inch prints. Trinity County Sheriff Tom, Tom Kelly has plaster cast made of the prints. Quote, whether it's a hoax or the real thing, we've got to come up with something because we got a lot of residents who are pretty shook up about this thing, Kelly said. But nobody came up with anything except a lot of fancy tales. Early last January, Bigfoot paid a visit to Wildwood over in the eastern part of Trinity County. Archie Bradshaw, an employee of the Lost Inn at Wildwood, told Deputy Sheriff Sam Jackson that he'd seen the creature peering in at him through a window during a howling snow howling snowstorm. <clears throat> Bob Kelly, owner of the Lost Inn, also saw the monster, Bradshaw says. Kelly opened the door and sicked his big police dog on the interloper, but the dog returned quaking with his tail between his legs. Kelly and Bradshaw loaded a shotgun and a pistol and chased the snowman with the aid of a flashlight. The creature outdistanced them. Other Wildwood residents told Deputy Jackson that Bigfoot was seven feet tall had a white, hairy chest with a pug nose. Some people swore Bigfoot's tracks were long and narrow, and others insisted they were long and broad. Most people who saw Bigfoot fleeing through the snow said he looked like he was broad jumping along with both feet tied together. Other, wood, other wild Woodians reported Bigfoot has hopped past the community's automatic laundry. Most Trinity County residents say it's about time for Bigfoot to show himself again. Spent a lot of time in Trinity County, very close to the coast, and a lot of weird things out there in that county. <laughs> so, a man named Jim McLaren. You can find Jim on Facebook. Jim McLaren, M C L A R I M. He's an ichthyologist in Central America. Well, in his younger years, Jim was tracking Bigfoot with a computer. And he was one of these guys, they said he was a zoology major, and he was saying that he was doing everything he could at the time to track him. Look up Jim McLaren on Facebook. He's a really, really good guy. Another man, a man that I really respected was an individual named Paul Freeman in the Walla Walla area of Washington. So Jim worked a private watershed as their ranger and he started to find weird tracks. Then he started to have weird things happen to him. He was smart, took his camera with him he started to cast the tracks. He gave a set of tracks to Ray Crow that he had personally taken. And they're phenomenal. They're little tiny things. It was a baby track. I've never seen them before. I've got them. If you go to the Sasquatch Outpost, part of their display is my collection of tracks. And that track came from Paul Freeman and Walla Walla. So get up to Bailey, Colorado and take a, take a tour of Jim's museum. It's really good. But the tracks are unusual because they are so small and they're in the middle of a nowhere area near Walla Walla. So Freeman took a lot of ridicule when he came out and he started to talk about it. But he didn't care, which was unusual. 
And he, and he laughed some people off because he knew he was on to something big. I personally think that the second best footage available out there of an actual Bigfoot is the Jim Freeman footage. And if you do some searching on the net, you're going to find it. And you never see the face, but you see the back and the head, and it's just as good as the Patterson Gimlin footage, in my humble opinion. November 1995, big test for Bigfoot going on at Ohio State University. Now, isn't that funny? We, we talked about Ohio at the beginning here, about the dead horse. It says researchers at Ohio State University hope to come within a hair of verifying the existence of Bigfoot. Scientists are using a new DNA matching process to determine whether there may be more to the Sasquatch legend than some blurry film image and a few giant footprints. Well, first of all, Patterson-Gimlin footage I don't think is blurry. I think it's very high quality. The evidence consists of two tufts of hair, each about a dozen individual strands, recovered from Washington State after a recent sighting. This is the first time that I'm aware of that anybody will be able to do any DNA extractions on Bigfoot, said Frank Poirier, chairman of Ohio State Department of Anthropology. I don't expect anything to happen because I'm pretty skeptical about this, but good science requires some wild goose chases from time to time. The testing is being done for the for the Oregon Regional Primate Research Center. They were using all animal primers and therein lay the problem. It wasn't until we did our DNA that we used human primers that we got back results. Oregon has a large number of Bigfoot samples, all of which they treat with great skepticism, said Paul First, OSU Associate Professor of Molecular Genetics Excuse me. These two batches sent to us had the best possibility of being real. The creatures reportedly were observed of a distance of about 100 feet in a dense dark forest. It was a sighting by forest rangers, Poirier said. After the creatures left, they picked the hair up off the locale and well, the prints and the knuckles. Hundreds of observers have decided, have described Bigfoot as being a furry, muscular primate standing six to 10 feet First and graduate student Jamie Austin are using a DNA testing protocol being developed by the FBI for analysis of hair strands that lack the roots normally needed for identification. So I'll tell you right now, Bigfoot hair has to have a root, a follicle, because that's where the DNA is. Because a Bigfoot hair, when you look at it under a microscope, is the core that goes through the middle of the hair is broken up. A human hair, the core is consistent. Austin, a forensic scientist, is using the Bigfoot hair as well as human and chimpanzee hair to do an independent genetic evaluation. The technique should be able to determine whether the Bigfoot hair came from a human or other known primate. Tests so far suggest the hair did not come from a primate, first said. Final results are expected this month. When the results didn't match what they wanted them to match, then you didn't hear anything more about the tests. Article October 23rd, 1998, the professor attempts to put Bigfoot pieces together with DNA testing. In a Tupperware container deep inside the Illinois State University refrigerator lie a few wisps of fur that could be the evidence whether Bigfoot lives. More likely the hair is that of a black bear, says Professor Angelo Caparella. But regardless of the DNA test, the first samples are part of a Caparella said is the first expedition for Bigfoot in a scientific methodology. If you have hair and you send them to a hair and fiber expert, in a minute or less, they can look under a microscope and match it, and it's done. And they know exactly what it is. They know, they would know if it's a bear. The phenomenon of Bigfoot dates back to the 50s. Well, I just showed you, it dates back to the 40s. 
in Northern California, Six Rivers National Forest heard the eerie sounds and found massive prints. Since then, thousands of devotees have tried to prove the creature's existence. But Caparella, a slight man with glasses, is a scientist. He's made his career discovering new species of animals, specifically birds, such as three previously unrecorded species. It strains the, quote, it strains the imagination that there's a large undiscovered primate there. I'm just as skeptical as anyone, Caparella said, but after all the years of reports and no one's tried to amplify these scientific methods. Specifically, Caparella is tracking evidence looking for waste in hair. The ultimate specimen we're looking for is a DNA sample. They can tell us what we're dealing with. We got 110 DNA samples. And I go back to what I've said at other classes. Why haven't one person in the academic world done a DNA test of Bigfoot hair, fiber, tissue? Not one. Why? Because they know the results we got were accurate. That's causing them problems. Now, as I was reading these articles and spending time on the Poopa Reservation, I was keeping copious notes about what I was experiencing, what I was learning, and that was the basis for this book, The Hoopa Project. If you look on Amazon, The Hoopa Project gets almost a perfect set of ratings. I'm very blessed for that. A couple of things I'm going to read to you out of the book that are important. In chapter three, it says a Bigfoot sightings overview. Almost every third hand story that I heard, I discounted and didn't write about it. The first oddity in the list when I accumulated my Bigfoot sightings reports incidents is that between 1988 and 1996, there was no activity. No one saw Bigfoot, experienced anything. Where'd it go? Why did it leave? There's also a significant nine year break from 75 to 84. Now the monthly breakdown of the reports that I got, there were never any in January or in March. The biggest month was always November. Now, November is also a big month for hunting, except that on the reservation you can hunt any time you want. Think about that. Now what time... So I'm keeping copious notes every time. Where, when, how, time, date, weather. Times of Bigfoot sightings Three were at midnight, one at 5 a.m., three at 6 a.m., five were at high noon, three were at 1 p.m., one was at 4 p.m. So a lot of people say, well, Bigfoot's nocturnal. Well, almost a third to a half of all the sightings I ever documented were during the day. So I don't know if you could say it's nocturnal. Maybe it has abilities that make nocturnal travel safer for it? I don't know. I'm not sure what to make of that. And then I categorized a series of incidents, and they weren't sightings. Type of incidents, screams, rock throwing, footprints, scat, general noise, Those were the biggies, and that's how I classify those. Those were just incidents. Now, affidavits. John Green, in his research on Bigfoot, when he was in British Columbia, was the first in any Bigfoot arena to use an affidavit to document a sighting. And when I did the background on Green's work, I thought, that's brilliant. 
It's brilliant because he documents it, Green. He listens to the story, sits down with the person, then he writes it up. The witness reviews it, makes sure it's accurate, makes any changes, signs it. And there you have your document. It signs it under penalty of perjury. So what you have going is something quite different than you have in the Bigfoot world today. There are several organizations right now that have notoriety of changing their reports to do away with any type of paranormal activity, any statements that say, oh, this was definitely a human looking. And they're trying to twist it as best they can to make it appear as an animal. And I've met probably a dozen investigators that work for these organizations and everyone said the same thing. Oh yeah, Dave, the owner does this. We, we can't do anything. We're just hanging around because we want part of the database when people call in a, a sighting. We know they're not credible reports. True. And the reason I'm telling you this is because I want you to be careful as an observer and somebody who's trying to understand the facts, not to believe everything you read. You gotta be careful. I've never had anyone that I've documented a report, they've signed an affidavit. I've never had anyone come back and say, oh, that, that's not what happened. Because they're signing it. They're saying, yeah, that's me. That's what I saw, that's what I did. So, I'm going to read you one story. And it's about a Hoopa forest planter. Hoopa tribe makes a lot of money by selling the wood that they harvest off their land. They make a lot of money off of it. So, the healthier their forest, the better the money they make. And so they hire professionals to manage it. And one man was named Jeff Lindsay. That's what I wrote. The Hoopa tribe requires a special permit for any non-tribal member to be on reservation property. Anyone can be on the paved section of the reservation, but once you travel off the dirt onto the dirt road, you need a permit. I had unlimited access on Hoopa because of the people I knew. And I went into some areas that were definitely very odd. But procedure calls for the Hoopa Tribal Forestry Department to review your request understand the need, and then inspect your vehicle for contaminants. There are several nasty tree diseases that exist in Northern California, and the tribe doesn't want anything to do with those. The tribe also doesn't want people harvesting their trees or stealing wild mushrooms. They want their forest to be pristine. They require that your vehicle be absolutely clean of any dirt, and brush, etc. The permits are for a maximum of one week. Then you must go back through the process again. The person assigned for inspecting vehicles, Jeff Lindsay. It was early one Wednesday morning in March when I first met Jeff. He's a 44-year-old Humboldt State graduate in biology. He greeted me with a big smile. Smile. I explained why I was there for the inspection, and I promised the car to be clean. He was, he was happy. He walked out to the car, and he looked it over carefully. Jeff said it was quite clean, and it passed. It was a rainy day, and we went back under the shelter to talk. Jeff asked me politely and specifically what I was doing in the woods, why I wanted the access. Jeff's questions started a healthy conversation. He, he grew up in Lodi, Boy Scout troop, etc. Went, went up into the Trinity Alps a lot, into the area named Papoose Lake. Papoose Lake in the Trinity Alps has notoriety of having a lot of really weird things happening. And Jeff talked about it. Talked about it when he was young and talked about it when he was old. He said he was at a place called Any Camp, E-N-N-I, and he stopped to take a break and casually walk an area in his pack. He said that he, as they were starting to walk through and around the area, a couple of teenagers began to walk towards them from a creek bed that was nearby. The teenagers told him there was too much snow at Papoose Lake, and his dad decided that they would camp at Any for the night. Jeff said that he decided to slowly walk the creek bed with the teenagers that night. As he looked in the creek and the soil, 
He walked approximately 100 yards when he came upon a huge footprint in a lone sandbar, the only one that was anywhere nearby. Jeff said that the boot print obviously was from the kids that walked down the creek, and it was near that point the footprint was 13 to 15 inches long, five toes, etc. Why did I read you this? This is important. You, again, as I stated, if you don't get into those areas where there's activity, if you don't get away from humanity, it's hard to justify that what you saw was something really strange. In Jeff's situation, he was in an area completely off the grid, hiking, saw some people, and they pointed out this track to him. And then subsequent to that, he went back into that area again years later and saw more tracks. Now, being a biologist, it struck him whole that this is something really unusual, not human, it's way too large. The impression it made in the dirt was too, too heavy and too thick for it to be human. And he said, yeah, Dave, he said, I think there's something unusual going on out there. And he says, those are my two stories. And he wasn't reluctant to talk about it. Uh, he gave me his picture. I said, oh, I don't care who it is. I'll stand behind what I said. And then he stated that there were other members in the Hoopa, Hoopa tribal office that also were willing to talk. And that took a while of me gaining their confidence, but they eventually came forward. And just as I got the U.S. Forest Service officer to talk, the Hoopa people were slow to talk about it too. Again, if you come from a point of credibility, honesty, looking for answers, no preconceived track, you're going to get met with that same honest integrity, openness, respectfulness. And I think that's why I was successful in Hoopa to, to gain a lot of this. Now, Hoopa also had a lot of ring, a lot of precipitation. And what I started to do was started to map and track the locations on the Pacific Coast in Northern California and Southern Oregon where there was a lot of sightings and the precipitation. One of the things that seemed to match up, at least in this area, was that there was a lot of rain and a lot of Bigfoot sightings. Native American once told me that Bigfoot likes pristinely clean water. And if there's a spring nearby, then that's where they would go for their water. Well, one of the things in the Trinity River and the Klamath River was pristinely clean rivers with huge runs of fish in that pristinely clean water. Last thing for today. When I was interviewing the Hoopa people, and I was talking to them about Bigfoot. Another topic came up, and the other topic was something that was in the Trinity River occasionally. And they described it as something similar to a giant eel, but I'm talking giant. The front of it would remind you of the front of a horse with its head that stuck up out of the water. And a body that could be anywhere from eight feet to 14 feet long that would look like an eel. And it swam in the river. I was studying Bigfoot, so I didn't, I didn't delve real deep into the topic, but it kept coming forward over the months and months I was there, people would talk to me about it. And the theory was, is that it came up from the ocean. And they said that this thing during certain times of the year would come up the Klamath River, which dumped directly into the Pacific Ocean. And this creature would swim up the rivers and go up the Trinity River looking for fish. And I thought, wow, kind of makes sense. Because something very similar to that has been reported in many parts of the world. Again, a horse type head that stuck up out of the water three to four feet sometimes, and a body that was lengthy, 
that you couldn't see all of it all the time. And if you do some research, you'll find that those type of reports have come in from other parts of the world about a very similar creature. The oddity is of it coming up out of the water. But even the Loch Ness Monster had a head that came up out of the water, but it really didn't look like a horse. And in conversations specifically stated it didn't look like that Loch Ness Monster. But there were too many reports of it for it not, not to have some credibility to it. And needless to say, when I fished those rivers, I was thinking, hmm, I'm looking, I'm, I'm using some pretty heavy line because I was going after some pretty big fish, but oh, I don't hook that thing. So it's class number seven today. And we're quickly marching towards some very interesting stories and some very interesting results that Harvey and I came to together. But that's class number seven. Hope you appreciated it. And you now have the same articles that I was reading that are important to me. Hopefully they're important to you. Thanks for being here. Politus out.